Good afternoon. I really can't hear you. Good afternoon. I know it's the end of the day. Everybody's eager to go and have a drink. And you'll have to listen to my voice and the voice of the great band we have ahead of us. Now, one of the things I often do to just keep people awake, I start singing. And my favorite song is Louis Armstrong. song. I say to myself, what a wonderful world. There are two possibilities when you do that. People run away from the room or they stay. And I'm glad you all stay for what is going to be a great, great conversation about financing climate change on the continent. I'm sure most of you remember about four years ago in Paris, there was a great agreement called the Paris Agreement signed by many countries and seen at the time as a major milestone in addressing climate change globally. Now, the bad news is since then, some people have removed themselves from that agreement. I'm not going to name any name. But the good news, things are happening on the continent to make sure we actually comply to our commitment with regard to addressing greenhouse gases on the continent. The number one action by our African governments of making sure that each of the countries that have signed the agreement have gone to what we call the climate change national strategies. And I believe many African countries have put together strategies showing that they've gone beyond the signed agreement, but showing commitment. The second good news on the continent, about 51 African countries have indeed ratified that agreement from Paris. Ratification is extremely important because one thing is to sign an agreement, the other thing is making sure it goes to the, your legal system back home to become a binding document across the continent. I think we deserve a big round of applause as African for signing that agreement <laughs> and ratifying it. Now, the implication, obviously, in signing it is money, and that is why we're here. We need to get some funding to make sure we keep that commitment. It's been estimated we need about $3 trillion by 2030 in making sure we can actually fulfill this commitment in the climate. And that is why the private sector is extremely aggressive in actually playing their part. About 72% of that funding will eventually come from the private sector to complement the funding that comes from the public sector. And that is why the African Development Bank, our bank, has decided to put together this alliance to make sure we can actually foster, incentivize private sector contribution in funding climate on the continent. So this is a tremendous opportunity for the private sector, tremendous opportunity for our financial institution on the continent. Before I bring in the director who is behind this at the bank, Anthony, to take us through what we are since the last time we had this meeting in the same place here in Johannesburg, I want you to put your hands together as I invite on stage the Vice President of the Energy and Power at the African Development Bank, who not only is going to set the scene for our conversation, but also welcome you. And I'll come back and keep talking. So, Ole, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, important dis uh, discussion. Uh, first and foremost, let me appreciate my heartfelt uh, appreciation for our panelists who are accepting to share their experiences at this pra practitioner's dialogue on the topic that is at the heart of AFDB's mission as well as the mission of uh, the Africa Investment Forum. This session's topic is about innovative approaches to impact investment and greening Africa's financial sector using the platform created by the African Financial Alliance on Climate Change, AFAC. We can no longer separate climate change from investment decision making. It is an influencer in terms of capital allocation. Let me put this in context. Almost, almost eight months ago, uh, Cyclone Idai made landfall 
in Mozambique. Less than six weeks uh, later, Cyclone Kenneth made landfall in Pemba, in, also in mo northern Mo Mozambique, about 600 miles from Idai's impact zones. Both storms killed over 1,000 people, affecting over 2.2 million people in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, and left behind infrastructure and livelihood destruction, estimated at over a billion dollars. In a space of two months, the economies of these countries had to absorb the shock of a billion dollar loss, not counting the loss of life. So if we assume that some of the destroyed property, the infrastructure was built with loans from financial institutions and payments were tied to revenues that would have been generated from these facilities, you'll find that with this level of destruction, it becomes difficult for loan agreements to be met and for subsequent loans to fix the damaged facilities, which increases the debt overhang we have in our countries. So for the longest time, climate change has been treated as an externality that only the public sector has responsibility for. This is no longer the case. With the growing physical costs that climate change is inflicting on African economies, markets have to be on, on alert, and we have to use market disciplines for dealing with the resulting um, impact of, 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 of these disasters. In fact, addressing the adaptation needs and aligning with the 2015 Paris Agreement is perhaps the biggest investment opportunity of this generation. Both climate action could, bold climate action could deliver at least 26 trillion in economic benefits between now and 2030, according to the new Climate Economy Report. Although there has been progress in understanding physical risks from climate change, few in the financial sector are incorporating these considerations into investment decision making, risk and risk management practices are still at a trial phase. In identifying the financial implications of climate risk, which create enormous opportunities for profitable investments by all types of investors, including both public and private finance. It is therefore imperative that Africa's financial system is aligned to truly unlock the capital necessary to lift millions of Africans out of poverty while safeguarding the planet. The financial system must be able to support the growing number of impact investors who are keen to deliver positive social and environmental impacts alongside profits. The African Development Bank through its high five agenda creates enormous opportunities to invest in Africa's sustainable future. The bank has further committed $25 billion over the next five years as climate finance to accompany such investments. Nonetheless, the bank is also acutely aware that the task is beyond any one institution or a country. It can only be achieved through partnerships. One of such partnerships is the one that has brought us here today, which is the African Financial Alliance for Climate Change. I look forward to a rich exchange of ideas and practical solutions to deliver Africa's sustainability goals, which are the core of Agenda 2063, to build the Africa that we want. Thank you very much. Indeed, to build the Africa we want, the Africa all of us have to contribute to, to make it the continent that we want as a whole. Now, we are mindful that some of you are actually new to the AFAC process, but some have been here last year, and a lot has happened since then. So what we'd like to do in the next session, I'd like to invite Dr. Anthony Young, who is Director of Climate at the African Development Bank, just to set the scene for us, update us in terms of where we are, and hopefully give us some food for thought, which I will pick up for our speakers. So give my hands to Dr. Anthony Young. Anthony. Thank you so very much, and thanks for being here. And thanks to the speakers, Vice President, thank you very much for coming. 
Um, good. This is a very popular diagram for me. I like to point this out constantly because it basically shows global vulnerability. And when you look at this map, it's a map of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, as we are impacted adversely by climate change. But then, what do we say? Most of us think this is an environmental issue managed by the ministries of environment, so we push those things aside when it's actually something that affects an entire economy. So climate change is not that which we should continue to confine as an environmental issue. And you agree with me that most ministries, the ministries of, in most countries, the ministries of environment receive some of the smallest budget to deal with these big global issues. So I keep bringing this out. But how is the financial sector responding to these threats? It is important that our financial sector understands that what we have there on the left are the things that make up what we call climate change. The temperatures rises, the droughts, the excess precipitations, and so on. But what do we have? Climate change basically affects the financial sector in clearly defined ways. The vice president has just talked about uh, debt overhang or where money is borrowed for infrastructure and that infrastructure is destroyed, what happens? So we realize that for insurance purposes, for instance, climate change drives up premiums because somebody just has to pay for it. And then we also see that it brings an increase in uninsurable risks. You can't quantify them. Most of the financial players on the continent are still grappling with how do you quantify the risks associated with climate change. And therefore, pension and sovereign wealth funds, they are adversely impacted. We build roads, we build serious infrastructure. But when these extreme events happen, what happens? Those infrastructures are the first things to go. And then it also leads to default risks in banks which we've just been told this afternoon. And then, ultimately, what happens? Financial instability. This is where the central banks are grappling with. So if you look through this, you find yourself somewhere inside this list. And when we have financial instability, what happens? Investors can't come in. So it takes us around a spiral, and we think this is not good enough, our financial sector needs to wake up, realize the importance of addressing climate change issues. But climate change is not all about doom and gloom. And I think that has been one of our greatest undoing because we've left it so much in the hands of environmentalists. We failed to speak the language of the private sector to understand what is in it. When it's all about risks, I talked about the risk because it is important that our financial system be climate proofed. We need to protect our financial systems. But then there are also opportunities out there that our financial sector needs to look at. This is the, it's not working. This is the population of the world. By 2040, Africa would be the largest continent overtakes anything you can imagine. While others are seeing it as a problem, I see it as a market. This is consumption. This is the power of consumption. And to understand that by 2040, the majority of the people would have moved into middle class, demanding electricity, demanding other infrastructure, water, resources, name them. The present structure cannot sustain that type of demand in the future. How do we align ourselves to that? I just put this briefly for just take energy alone. When we talk about energy, most times we look at electricity, but we've split it into electricity and clean cooking because it's not just about uh, electricity. When you look at this, you see where the opportunities are. And so climate change is not just about let's run away, it's gloom. 
it's giving us an opportunity to do things differently. I keep saying uh, other brothers who've developed today are struggling to bring down emissions, which means they want to be like us. So why do we want to be like them? Trying to raise emissions, you know? And I think we should have a patent here that the African continent says, you want to cut down your emissions, you come pay us. We tell you how to do it because we've been doing it. So there are very good opportunities out there. But we also have other opportunities for finance. There's money available, a lot. But unfortunately, as I speak, the 2018 report of the Climate Policy Institute is out. Africa just has 3%, again, of the total climate finance. Even when the total climate finance is rising, Africa's portion still stays at 3% which is not good enough. So when you look at the global landscape, by 2070, $35 trillion worth of assets under management be under threat. This is the time for us to plan towards that. It's going to affect our banks. It's going to affect our investment companies. The insurance needs to think through what can be done there. Just from last year and now, $11 trillion have been divested from fossil fuel. What can the African banks do to position themselves to get that money? Because it's going to be invested somewhere. And Africa is, is not the next investment destination, it's the current investment destination. And you can see everyone is forming alliance with Africa, Israel, Africa, Russia, Africa, Saudi Arabia, Africa, everywhere, which is very important because of these partnerships, because everyone realizes this is the opportunity. Impact investment, 502 billion, growing. It's showing that not everybody is just blinded by profit alone. There are many that also want to balance the environmental and social impacts along with their profits. So things are happening there. And this year alone, over $200 billion worth of green bonds have been issued. Shows the appetite. Things are happening. So we need to flow with it. But when you look at the African continent on its own, the vice president talked about the three trillion with the moderator. African countries have signed the nationally determined contributions. When we look at those agreements, within there, if you aggregate all the commitments we've made, it's about $3 trillion. We can either look at it as $3 trillion, where do we get that money from? Or this is where we can bring in investors into this market. Everything, almost everything in those NDCs lend themselves to private sector investment. So if we have a $3 trillion investment opportunity, why are we struggling with just $502 billion in impact investment? when the whole of the three trillion is about impact investment. The same for cities, I mentioned cities. We need about one trillion to make our cities sustainable and smart cities. And the list goes on. The vice president has talked about the 25 billion which the African Development Bank is putting in. But the good news is that the MDBs are putting in 50 billion every year, collectively, to addressing climate change issues and seizing the opportunities in transition economies. And many of them are on the African continent. So there's a lot of resources out there for us to work with. But what needs to be done? We can't keep going the way we've been going. We need to have a conversation. We need to sit together and check who are the key players in this industry. There's money on the continent. Frankly, if you look at the size of Africa's economy, the assets under management, these banks, the sovereign wealth funds, there's a lot. But because we're looking at them in piecemeal, we are not seeing the full picture. So for this, what we've looked at is, what is it that the various players can do? Government institutions, policies. Money does not like noise, somebody said. It's quiet. It goes to where things happen you know, smoothly. How do we create that enabling environment to allow this timid capital to come out? So that's the work of governments. Then we have the national, regional, and 
So institutions like the African Development Bank, what can we do? We can create the risking instruments. We can do a lot to support. And the list goes on. We have the rating agencies and the stock exchanges. We have the banks. We have the institutional investors. And so what we have done is that the African Financial Alliance on Climate Change brings in all these people together. The problems of the commercial banks cannot be resolved by the commercial banks alone. The central banks come in. Central banks cannot resolve it alone because the ministries have policies. Why would anybody want to invest in your money when you can buy government treasury bonds almost at the same rate with whatever? It just doesn't make sense. So we need to bring everyone together to find out what exactly must we do to ensure that we direct resources are right. So it's a voluntary membership of all the financial institutions on the continent. And we have four key things we're doing. Based on consultations with many of these institutions, what are the four key things they said they want to see AFAC help them do? The first is knowledge sharing. There's so little knowledge on climate risk, climate change opportunities for the banks to work with and the other private sector players. The second is mainstreaming climate risk, mitigating financial instruments and technologies. It's very important. The third is enhancing risk disclosure. We have the climate-related uh, financial disclosures. It's a global initiative. Not a single African institution is reporting to it. And so we want to address that as part of the effort. And finally, how do we channel investments to low carbon and climate resilient development? What must we do? So those are the things that EFAC is working on. We have been able to set up principles. These principles have been approved by the steering committee of EFAC. And these principles are such that we believe once you commit to them, then you're on the right path to do what needs to be done. The first is that you commit to climate action, urgent climate action. You see the urgency in it. It's not something that's okay, we'll do it, because every day counts, every year counts. The second principle is that we commit to managing climate action and risk. There's a commitment, then you begin to manage it. The third is commit to develop tools to monitor climate action in our institutions, in our organizations, we need to do it. Fourthly, we need to integrate climate action in strategic decisions. Things are happening in other places. If we do not factor this into our strategic decisions, then we'll be playing catch up. And the fifth is disclose climate action and risk. We need to be transparent about this. So those are the five principles that have been adopted. And so what have we done in the first year since its launch? The first is that we've established an 11-member advisory committee of eminent, eminent, eminent persons. One of them is sitting here, Dr. Banda. We've established the secretariat of this at the bank. Then we've gone on a membership drive. But alongside that membership drive, we are also carrying out training sessions. We don't take it for granted that our SMEs and banks understand precisely what it means to integrate climate risk into their portfolios. So we're working with them, building that awareness, getting them to understand the benefits of this. And then finally, we're doing sector consultations also. What is our goal? for the next year. We want to be able to design and deploy context-specific industry tools, metrics, and skills enhancement packages. The needs for insurance companies are very different from the needs from development banks. So we're working to design these very sector-specific tools and then design incentive packages and reward system. This is very important because what we ultimately will end up with is what we call the Africa Decarbonization and Resilience Index that will assess every African financial institution on their contributions to decarbonizing and building resilience on the continent. Some institutions are already telling us, bring it on. It's going to be like the ease of doing business of the World Bank. Countries, institutions will be struggling to see how they can move up the ladder. And by moving up the ladder, there'll be 
instilling good practices down the line. And then finally, we want to foster partnerships. No institution can do it alone. No country can do it alone. The alliance will bring everyone together. We want to learn. Why is institution A doing better than B? We need to know so that institution B can also do as well as A. So I think that's where it is for now. I want to thank you for your attention. And what we want to do today is basically how can we get it right and unlock the resources that are available on the African continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. I like that expression, money does not make noise. Knowing that our next institution, actually, that are coming on stage, do provide a lot of money and they don't make a lot of noise. So that's what we have our next week. And I think uh, from your presentation, I'm delighted we actually now have a better visibility in making the case about why we should all be involved, but more importantly, the opportunities ahead of us, which we have to seize, and what AFAC is all about, extremely inclusive, if you want to be actually a member of this great organization. It is now my pleasure to call upon our next speakers to come on stage in general. I'm going to call each of them. Dolly Kabanda, who is the CEO, MD of Africa Risk Capacity Insurance Limited. Give a round of applause. Dolly on stage. <laughs> Ms. Zodwa Mbele, who is a group executive for transactioning at DBSA. Roberto Ridolfi, Assistant Director General of FAO. And last but not least, Stefano Signore from the EU is going to join us. I think, Dalika, I'm actually going to start with you and being extremely direct on the question about the funding gap. As you heard Anthony's presentation, talk about the huge gap we have in funding. But if you look at it from a perspective as an opportunity, from where you sit, what needs to be done to actually fill the gap? What is it we need to do differently in terms of innovating as an instrument to fill in the gap? Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, panel. And I know it's after lunch, so it's very hard to concentrate. I hope we can wake you up. <laughs> so I think Anthony mentioned we have a, a $200 billion per annum gap to be able to meet the 2030 uh, Paris commitment. There is a lot of money out there, but somehow we seem to have problems in terms of filtering that funding institutionally into where it is most needed. For me, this conversation is a conversation about risk management. At the end of the day, the impact of climate-related um, disasters is going to be a political risk, it is a social risk, and it is a financial and economic risk. I think if we look at these issues in that perspective, then we can start to think differently about how we approach the impacts of climate change and how we approach hazards and try to stem them before they form into disasters. So for me, I think for this room, we need to start considering how do we think out of the box and how do we approach climate change as a resilience building, as a protection for our economies, for our populations. Not everybody is going to migrate to Europe and we're going to have to live with this and we're going to have to manage it and build better. So I think the conversation today should be about risk management, social, economic, political, and how do we tap into all of the different financing mechanisms that are out there and all the different partners that are ready to help with this problem, ex ante, upfront, preparation, pre-financing, the tools are there. The financial sector is one of the most innovative sectors Ever. When we wanted to do microfinance, we went through the financial sector. When we wanted to do SMEs, we went through the financial sector. Now we're talking green bonds, we're going to, through the financial sector. I say we elaborate this story. I say we speak louder. I say we think bigger. I say we think out of the box. Yes. 
Thank you, Delica. I, I guess, Delica, before I move to the next speaker, my following question to you, though, then concretely, because the organization that you run is entirely focused on providing insurance when it comes to like, risk associated with disaster, and in some cases, like the climate change. Is there, what exactly are you doing at ARC, the African Resources uh, Risk Capacity, in providing this instrument to African countries so we can actually bring in the finances needed to address climate change? And I usually don't like to, I'm usually told on panels we should never advertise our organization. Yes, you can. But I am going to take free <laughs> liberty with that question. So the African risk capacity, and some of you were here last year, and please indulge me as I repeat myself, is a homegrown African solution to the problems that we're here to solve today. It was set up in 2012 under the African Union that is under what we call agency, that is the mother body. That mother body has the authority to set up affiliates that assist with dealing with climate-related disasters. The insurance company, and my colleague is here, Monsieur Mohamed Biafugui, who runs the agency. The idea is to set up different affiliates to deal with different aspects of climate change and other disasters. So today, we, have, we cover drought and we are very close to covering flood, and we are in discussions regarding tropical cyclone. But aside from that, we have gone on to the resilience and protection gap story. Remember I said this is a political, social, and economic risk. We are now looking, with the help of a number of different foundations and good, goodwill people, at outbreaks and epidemics. We are currently piloting those. So we're really trying to build resilience at the lowest level. Right. Just to show off a little bit, right. we are coming from Cote d'Ivoire and, 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 and Senegal. We are making a payout to those two countries as we speak of about approximately $24 million. Now $24 million may not sound like a lot of money in terms of the actual output, but studies have shown that a dollar paid three months within the onset of a disaster, especially drought, is worth $4 spent nine, nine months later. So effectively, we're putting $100 million into the system within 14 days of drought being declared. Right. So there's much more I can say, but I, I'll leave that for later. We'll, we'll leave it to that for, for now. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Mrs. Mary, let me turn over to you. You work for DBSA. My first question to you, you talked about the funding gaps in order to fill the gap with both public and private sector, but in particularly mobilizing domestic finances. So what's your take in terms of what do we need to do differently in mobilizing those resources? So uh, thank you very much, Program Director. So, I mean, as a DFI, you know that you've always been very much engaged in the sustainability. You know, back in the day, we used to follow, you know, the quota protocol in our environmental, um, you know, assessment. So, but we have gone a step further, you know, in terms of accessing, you've just talked about, there's plenty of funding out there. It's a matter of tapping into that. Uh, we have tapped into the GCF, the Green uh, Climate Fund, and two facilities from that perspective, in a sense that we want to blend that kind of financing. Um, so one facility is in respect of uh, um, CFF, where we, we need to fund projects with technologies that have not really been commercially proven, uh, but which are addressing climate change, and we'll blend that with the DBSA funding. So we've raised about 55 million US dollars in respect of that, which will obviously be matched by the DBSA contribution of about 650. And that will also be leveraged with other financiers, so we're basically crowding other financiers. Another aspect to it, we have another different facility where, um, you know, with these, the IPPs, you know, what we talk in South Africa, it's embedded generation self-provisioning. So the regulatory framework, once it's uh, clarified where they can self-generate, but it's still a risk from the commercial banks because if you think about the infrastructure financing is long-term long in nature and you have only the sole uh, offtake, in this case it wouldn't be the utility. So the risk is deemed to be so uh, quite, um, you know, on a high side from the commercial uh, aspect point of view. But obviously as a DBSA, that's why we come in where we can tap into the GCF so that we can elongate the tenor in order to facilitate such um, uh, projects. So that's really what we are looking into. But further to that, we've also been working with the National Development 
banks because DBSA is now accredited by the GCF for them to get ready and tap into those facilities. So in the regions, there are a couple of uh, countries that we have kind of tried to assist. So far, one of them is also in Lesotho because each country should really be ready and have uh, the, the environmental safeguard that will enable them to be accredited. Again, most countries, I guess, they suffer from the, 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 record, the, the history in respect of implementing um, re uh, climate resilient uh, projects. So that's where we think we need to also share the skills as we have spoken about earlier on and assist them to put the framework so that they can be accredited. So that's really what we are trying to do so that you can have more, the more we have the merrier we are. All right, excellent. Thanks. So from ARC and DBSA, we're gonna move to another DFI was also equally important in what we're trying to do. And EU, I'm turning over to you, Stefano. My question to you, in most of the countries in Africa, you're involved in providing long-term financing. I am have absolutely sure in your conversation, climate financing comes up. What exactly the EU is doing in supporting this African government and actually meeting that funding gaps we just talked about earlier? Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as we know, uh, the gap is, is huge, uh, and we uh, are uh, supporting uh, um, uh, African government in, in many areas. Um, of course, uh, what is uh, at stake is um, well support to, to governance. This we, we do, for instance, through budget support to dedicated programs, but we also are more and more active in uh, working in the business climate, business environment. And of course, I mean, we want also to use uh, the limited resources we have as official development assistance to uh, leverage uh, private uh, financing, basically, uh, to make it sure that we can leverage, attract uh, the um, private uh, financing through uh, the risking, which is basically at the very heart of the uh, European External Investment Plan which has been also uh, discussed, presented in other, in other forum. Uh, we are putting on the table uh, for the period, I mean, in the, in the, in the current period, uh, more than four billion uh, between uh, traditional blending and uh, guarantees. By the way, two guarantees agreement are being signed the time we speak in another room, so it's uh, very timely. Um, uh, in order to mobilize up to 44 uh, billion euro. But we want to scale up this in the future. I mean, this uh, investment, investment, uh, support investment will be one of the main uh, delivery mechanism of our uh, financial assistance in the next generation of fund between 2021 and 2027. Uh, but at the same time, we also want to continue supporting, uh, as I said, uh, governance, uh, regulatory reform, and so on. Maybe just a mention uh, of a sector which is very important for us, which is energy. We are presenting tomorrow of a report on uh, sustainable energy investment, uh, a result of a work we have uh, done jointly with our Af African partners for almost one year. And energy is one of these areas where it's clearly transformational and they can elaborate more later on. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stefano. And Roberto, let me turn over to you, because one of the part of the conversation that has not come up quite often, in addition to funding and opportunities, there's a serious capacity issue in building capacities across the continent to address climate change issues. What exactly is your institution actually doing in supporting African government when it comes to capacity building dealing with climate change? Well, the key word is mainstreaming, okay? Do we agree here that in order to achieve the 2030 agenda, not only on climate, but on sustainability at large, we need to mainstream it everywhere? So that, why don't we start from economic faculty in universities? Because that's the fundamental paradigm. Nobody is paying the natural capital today. Okay, let's start from there. And in the natural capital, there is the climate, the consequences. So for me, four points, really. And we come to FIO in a minute. Sure. The first is changing the fundamental of economic the theory. Green economy, circular economy must become mainstream and not subordinated. Two, science-based solution. Science-based solution. We have to stop fooling ourselves with language in policy papers, which is so nice 
for the uh, annual uh, shareholders meeting, but in practice there are no tools to translate in metrics what we claim we will do. How many policies of sustainability we have seen in companies, big conglomerates, in big banks, that are not supported by metric evidence on science. And that metric and evidence exists, is the SDGs, is 244 indicators, complicated, but we can handle. That's where FIO starts uh, coming in. We are custodian of these indicators, so we provide the tools and the metric to measure how much carbon are you trapping with that investment? How much carbon are you reducing through a certain particular attention to your investment in livestock, in agriculture, in everything? We do have a, a tool called EXACT, which is used by African Development Bank, which is used by World Bank, which is used by uh, IFAD and other partners of our investment center, but is not used by commercial banks. And they manage trillions. So until we, man we, we impact on the billions, we don't make the difference. The third point, investment uh, uh, push. Investment push is important. And the fourth point is policy pool. Right. Policy pool is about the risking by the public. I'm, I'm sick and tired to do the risking. Eh? I'm starting in 2006 with the JRF, the first fund of fund in Luxembourg, where we leverage public money 1 to 32. A fund of fund with public money taking the first loss. 2006, 2007, we incorporated it and we invested in what? in renewable energy and energy efficiency. I'm talking of my previous life as director <laughs> of the European Commission, of course. But uh, I am sick and tired of the risking. The risking is good, but it's not enough. The risking is good, but it's not enough. We have so many trillions of money fetching negative interest rates. Shall we move them in Africa, where returns are very, very encouraging or not? Is anybody due to the risk? So I'm talking about the policy pool because we can reduce uh, TVA, 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 you know, the tax on uh, added value. We can reduce it for, uh, for decarbonization. We can reduce it for sustainability. We can uh, credit agricole, a few days ago, came up with reduced interest rate for investments which are sustainable. And then the investment push, and I close. The investment push is the most important today. Institutional investors, where are they? Who pushes in the investment uh, arena? The consumer or the pension funds? I think it's a push and pull eh, from both sides with the financial markets in between. But the consumer must be get used to buy sustainability. If the consumer wants sustainability, we refuse to buy what is not sustainable. And so you won't have a differential in price in producing sustainably. And that's where FIO comes useful to the banking system, producing tools and metrics. Of course, it should not be too complicated. Eh? I say always to the PhDs in FIO to be simple, so simple that even a banker can understand you. <laughs> I have, by the way, that Roberto so many times, but he never surprises me. Always with his thought process and then act the for thought. Thank you for that contribution. I'm going to go to the audience and get some feedback and some questions. Hopefully, we'll keep it as short as possible to get back to. But what I want you to think about when we came back to at the end is if you look at a platform like AFAC, how do you actually make it work to make sure it's actually inclusive and get as many actors as possible to be on board? Because the case has been made. The question is, how do we make it work? All right, so can we take questions? If you could just state your name and then give us a short question, hopefully, <laughs> we can get back to our speakers on stage. There's a microphone circling there. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Rebecca Cameron. I'm from ICLE Local Government for Sustainability, Africa. I feel a little bit like the voice of subnational government at this forum, probably because they're all at the UCLG conference in Durban. Pretty weak for South Africa. But um, 
I just wanted to kind of really reflect on that, that topic about why aren't we moving the money? And I think subnational governments are increasingly receiving more and more devolved mandates by their national governments, as there's a push for that um, across the continent. And um, what we're seeing in our work um, across kind of 25 countries in Africa, um, what we're really seeing is that local governments are, are growing in their capacity and their understanding um, of finance, and they have this desire to get projects funded. Um, so we work quite hard with them on terms of, um, in terms of capacity building and training in this financial um, sector because often it's very new for them, especially um, if previously many have been and still are unable to get direct loans. But um, my kind of my question is how are we, you know, many municipalities struggle with the big pots of money. You know, municipalities on average, you know, a big project will be like 10, 20 million rand. Um, or like, yeah, about two million euros, yeah, US dollars or so. Um, in, and so we need these intermediaries to be splitting the money, which is where I really like kind of the DBSA programs, and so you can apply into that. Sorry. My question is, how are we um, creating these institutions, strong institutions, where local governments can submit projects, um, which for smaller amounts in order to mobilize that money um, and, and, and quite quickly? Yes, so wh what contribution are, are you all making and what's the future of that, in your opinion? Lovely, thank you. Uh, right here in front, hoping that we can also keep it a bit short so we can get more questions. Yes, don't worry about it. Thank you. Uh, I, um, my question actually relates to what Anthony was presenting and uh, also what uh, Signore Ridolfi was also mentioning. Oh, sorry. Okay, I have to stand up. Yes, go ahead. Um, so we can see you. I, I cannot stop thinking about this um, index that you were talking about. And the question is about what other roles the government should take and how do you think they're prepared in Africa? When we talk about the government and de-risking and uh, subsidized financing, etc., that's one area that is very interesting. However, taxing carbon is another area for which the index could actually provide an excellent ground for governments or for taxing companies in a different way. Now, how prepared is Africa on moving forward into that part? as well. That's a question that I, I just wanted to also put on the table. Excellent. Good question. So we're going to move to the other side so we can be fair and balanced. Any question on that side? Because we don't know, go back to the other side and get more questions. Yeah, on the back there. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Leila Ben Hassan. I'm from Blue Jay Communication. And my question is for Senor Ridolfi. It's also about the index. So I would like to know you mentioned they're called exacts. So when were these index done? And also, what is important is about accountability because we know we need to know where are we today and where are we tomorrow. So is there like a team or committee following up with this index? Who are they? And how can we know how is Africa performing with this index? Excellent question, Leila. Thank you. On, on the back there, I see a hand. Hi, my name is Devin Naidu. I'm from the Private Finance Advisory Network. We help projects uh, secure private sector finance for uh, essentially clean energy and now more for climate change. I think the reality is that uh, there is a lot of need for financing uh, climate change. There definitely isn't enough public finance, but the business models don't exist. And I think on the basis of the fact that in renewable energy, we've developed mechanisms and we've de developed business models in moving towards climate change projects, more adaptation projects, one should transition from uh, renewable energy into the kind of sectors where you can attract the finance that's available. We know that there's a lot of money out there looking for projects, but where's the business models, where are the projects? And I think that there's an opportunity when one starts looking at, for example, energy for agriculture or the kind of forestry residues and what you can do with that. Uh, and it's really more a uh, suggestion than a question. Excellent, thank you. One last question. 
All right, we already got uh, four great questions. One was about the institution that you represent, what kind of uh, support they can provide so that domestic financing is actually available, particularly when it comes to municipalities and the continent with regard to climate change. The second question, how far the African government actually can go when it comes to providing the right incentive when it comes to climate change. And the third question about the index, where do we stand on that? And last question is whether yes or no, climate change as a business model, is it something actually viable for any private sector to actually want to put some money into it? And not any particular order, Dalika, I'm going to start with you. If you can react to what you heard, and then we'll move on to Mrs. Mbele and the rest of the speakers. Go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Ibrahima. A set of um, very interesting questions. Um, I'm compelled to say up front that I think we do, I'm a banker by the way, Rodolfo, but I, I understood you, so that's good. <laughs> we, we, we follow the models that we know and understand and feel very comfortable with. So we are following the project finance model, and how, which is what we're here to do, but I think I really want to encourage that we start to think bigger than just the project level, because we spend billions of dollars investing in the projects, whether it's infrastructure, education, health, agriculture, and we focus less on managing the downside risk. Either I proved to us that all of the investment that had been done by DFIs, private sector, government, into infrastructure could be wiped out in three days literally three days. The statistics we are still counting is that for the three countries, that is going to be about a 6% dislocation in GDP. These events are going to get more intense, more frequent, more impactful. In the Caribbean, Fiji and Vanuatu, between 30 and 37% of GDP is the impact. Africa must prepare for that. We must prepare for that. And I want to link that to the question of how far are governments willing to go. We have been in existence since 2012. We did our first insurance pool, so we pool the risk of African states. We would have wanted to go to the end beneficiary, but affordability is an issue and reach is an issue. So we've started by going at the sovereign level. So our client who pays the premium is the governments of these countries. Since inception, we've had six pools year by year. We go to the agrarian, agrarian season. We have signed 37 policies. Governments off of their own national balance sheets have paid $74 million in premium in six pools. We have covered cumulatively $550 million roughly in coverage, and we have protected 54 million people. Now, the insurance has not always triggered, but that is the coverage, that is the protection that African governments have said, we do need to provide for this risk, and they have come off of their own balance sheets to do this. So the willingness is there, and we have to meet them halfway. We have to meet them and say, where are you most vulnerable? The de-risking question I understand, but the question we should be having, which is what we have with our countries, is on the one side, the capacity, the contingency planning, the preparation, the identification of the risk. Only after a country has been through that process and received from an independent panel of us a certificate of good standing that says we understand where our vulnerability is, is it drought, is it tropical cyclone, et cetera. Only then can we sell them an insurance policy. Right. So, so I think we need to think beyond a project. Projects will be very, very important, but we need to think about this in a holistic manner. Gotcha. Thank you. You got Mrs. Bele, from what you heard, what's your reaction? Uh, I'll focus more on the municipality, the capacity building to enable municipalities to access uh, climate financing. So at the DBSA, we have the project preparation unit, and currently there's a pilot project that we're working on at the feasibility study level for six municipalities um, on the solid waste management program. So once that has been proven to work, it will be rolled out to the other 24 municipalities So and on a programmatic approach. So obviously, if it's, it is successful, all the 
other municipalities who have less capacity can opt in into that platform that would have worked out. So there's a number of programs that we run on a programmatic programmatic approach like we did with the IPP. It's a similar thing that we're trying to do this time around on the climate facility. All right, so Stefan, i turn over to you, the EU. What's your reaction to what you heard? Yeah, I want to pick up on three questions, but they will be short. Okay. The first one on uh, municipality. I think that we're working a lot uh, at, civil, at city level. For instance, we are supporting the Covenant of Mayor of Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 200 cities already, uh, let's say, joined. But I think that what we are currently not doing enough is to connect the work we are doing with city, city level with the national level. I mean, we know that is where the problem lies. I mean, I was listening to the mayor of Accra in New York a couple of months ago, and he was saying, yes, I mean, I have a lot of ideas, a lot of projects, but uh, in fact, there are a lot of limitations in the finance I can access because of national legislation. So I think what we need to do more is to connect these two levels, and we also need to work on cities with national governments. Uh, the question on, uh, let's say, carbon market and so on, yes, I think that even if uh, we still don't have uh, a clear picture of how carbon markets would look in the, in, the, in the future, because we know, for instance, I don't want to enter into technicalities, that work under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement is not finalized, it will be discussed and hopefully solved in the next uh, COP in Madrid. But I think that there is a potential there for many African countries, because we know that many countries around the world will have to tap into the opportunities of carbon market, including in Africa. Look at what, uh, for instance, Gabon is doing for forest preservation and red mechanism like Red Plus and so on. So uh, let's say African countries can benefit from it, including financially. And the last uh, question, it was for a business model for climate, uh, climate related. It's true, I mean, there are a lot of examples, I mean, uh, also on energy, uh, let's say on uh, energy, water, food, nexus, or, you know, uh, use uh, of energy for uh, pr productive use. But I think where we struggle is in identifying a business model that can be scalable, replicated easily, because uh, scale is, uh, is uh, uh, the essence. So I think that there we have still a bit of work to do in uh, developing business models which are scalable. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stefano. Now, Roberto, the index. Yeah, I will answer to two combined questions on index data and reporting or measuring. Uh, uh, the most important thing is to have tools. I came here with a small booklet which is a, a small repertory of tools that we are developing in FIO. Six of them are already operational. Two are on the making. One of these six that is operational is this X Act, which is actually a tool to be applied to investment in agriculture and in food systems, so also to the industrial part of the food uh, development, in order to reduce the emissions, measuring them so that you plan an investment, you go to the bank, if you reduce your emission by 40% vis-a-vis the average in the market, the bank give you a discount in the interest rate. Let's put it like that. Number two, index. The most important things of index is that they must work for the market. I'm looking at indexes. You remember the people that are of a certain age would remember that 30 years ago, the cost of financing for renewable energy was here. The cost of financing of oil and gas was here. Today is the opposite. This is due to do two big factors. The big incentives and the policy in the European Union, Germany in particular, and then the industrialization in China on the pro production of the components, and also one index that was launch launched by Bloomberg in New York an index measuring the degree of uh, uh, renewable energy in companies producing. That index at the beginning, nobody was looking at it. Little by little, the investors, because investors, they look at graphics, at data. They don't think, they just look at figures <laughs> or they think too fast. They look at figures, so if the graph goes up, they put the money there, right? I imagine this word. Of my <laughs> and therefore, we have to create indexes that people investing will look at. 
like it was done on renewable energy, we launched one, we are trying to launch one on biodiversity, agrobiodiversity. So if the company is good in promoting and preserving biodiversity, the index goes up. And therefore, today, you don't look at it, but the pension fund in Denmark tomorrow will say, hey, I like that, let's go for it. And that is the driver in the market. We need to create more and more on that, but we need data. And, and, and to have data, we need somebody that measures it. And again, we are doing this for governments, but we can do these tools and this kind of mechanism for companies and for banks. Roberto is saying that if you're going to present the project in the boardroom for the next couple of days, make sure the graph actually go up so the investors will be impressed. <laughs> and, but thank you very much. Unless we have another burning question for the audience, we're going to wrap up this session. Go ahead in the back. I see a hand. Can we give him a, a mic, please? Uh, what's the appetite and uh, direction with carbon capture programs and methane capturing programs? Because there's a lot of talk about markets of carbon, but in the US and other places already, carbon capture systems are in place to capture methane, convert it from capturing it into biodegradable plastic. So there's a business there, but is there regulation there? Are they enforcing? Is Africa looking in this? Even the EU. I know the US is moving forward with it, but I'm not sure about the others. Uh, good question. I saw a hand here on this side. Can you just give a microphone, please? Yeah, thank you very much. My name is uh, Mohammed Mansouri. I work at the FAO, um, the director of the investment center of FAO. I wanted just maybe to respond to the question or try to contribute to the gentleman on the business models. Actually, uh, you know, the food and agriculture sector is, is very contextual in a way. And the business models, you know, are developed at that level. It's not that you can develop a business model, for example, for solar energy that you can really scale up all over the place. And there is that issue of scalability there. But I want to raise another point, which is that the capacities of a lot of the financial institutions, so the financing institutions, in some of those sectors are also quite low. And then that prevents them from having the courage, you know, to go towards those sectors that tend to be a bit more complex, as Roberto was saying, uh, than you know the the, the typical uh, uh, sectors or subsectors so economic activities where business models can be easier uh, to to grasp. So the capacity issue is also on the financial sector to equip itself with the knowledge, uh, with the approaches, the methodologies, and so on, in order to be able to respond to the needs. Thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution. I saw a hand here. Yeah, it's going to be last probably one. For a wrap up, go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Anela Makwaza. Uh, I'm from Ikuku Global, which is a green finance deal route based in Nigeria. When we have uh, the conversation around climate risk and, and just transitioning bank, banks and banking as a system, a huge aspect of the challenge we find is that you can't have the conversation with uh, bank executives or C-suite executives if they don't know where they actually are or what the balance sheet looks like. Um, so indexes and the like are very helpful. But from this conversation, I've learned that in the insurance industry, we're maybe making a little bit more progress in kind of defining risk premia across sectors. Uh, but I'd like to know a little bit more in terms of what's being done um, across around extending those risk premia into the banking conversation in terms of risk-adjusted pricing and how we look at balance sheets altogether. Excellent. We'll have to probably, unfortunately, wrap it up at this point. And Dolika, on the premium and the risk extension, maybe you can take that one. If anybody wants to take the question about the capital-related uh, business, so Roberto, I'll give it to you. I see your hands there. Go ahead, Dolika. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> That's a, very, a really good question. I think even in the insurance industry, um, we're not where I think we should be. We were talking this morning, I think I was talking to, to Tony about the need to scale. The, the, the problem is bigger than, than, than our day-to-day -day language. So what you identify is a challenge even in the insurance industry. But I have found there always has to be some leaders, right? In the Nigerian banking sector, I know when I was with the IFC, we actually just had to get 12 of the top banks 
and say we're going to do sustainability banking. So you need some champions, you need to identify them. It's a hard slog, but the game, the end goal is what we all know is extremely important. So the conversation in the banking sector, of course the premium financing is normal, but insurance is perceived to be a gamble for most of our clients. It's the first thing to go when your, bu when your budget is tight. So you have to keep that relationship management. You have to also, I mean, Roberta, you were talking about indices, but you also have to show most of our clients what you would have not lost or what would have been covered had you insured during this crisis or that crisis. So the conversation has got to be very much to the institution or to the end beneficiary or to your client, what is the opportunity cost of not doing this? Whether you're in banking or whether you're in, in infrastructure or whether you're in insurance, the opportunity cost is what you've got to focus on and the value for money is what you've got to focus on. Excellent. Today, we are reinsuring the bulk of our portfolio. We are reinsuring with 24 globals, including Africa Re here on African soil. So they, they, they get the message, they need somebody said the business case or the platforms or the vehicles, and this is one such platform that we have built as African risk capacity. All right, uh, Roberto, one last intervention and then we'll wrap up quickly. The for carbon trapping is huge. Sometimes it's uh, misleading, this kind of appetite, because it's a little bit a la mode, it's fashion, whereas there uh, should be solid evidence, again, based on science. What is the opportunity cost of not doing it? Well, I give you a figure. The GDP of the planet today is around 80 trillion, right? Biodiversity is estimated to be valued around 45 trillions. So if we lose it, that's what we lose. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. I know this conversation could go on probably the, the whole day, uh, but let me just wrap up by asking each of you, because now we have to bring it back to AFAC, because that's really why uh, we're here. In uh, getting into this conversation, we really want to address three fundamental issues. One, in light of what Tony has presented, there's certainly a funding gap, and that gap will be filled by public and private sector money, and I think some of you are part of that solutions. And I think the second thing is to say, what are the African countries have the capacity to really comprehend the economic and the financial implication of not doing anything on climate change? And the, the last but not least, uh, tremendous investment opportunities, that's why we're at AIF today, so the question is, what do we need to do to actually to harness those opportunities? So I'm going to ask each of you, probably in uh, 30 seconds, if you could do it, or maybe 45 seconds, if you could tell me just one big recommendation you would like to make to AFAC to make it work so that it becomes an alliance that not only works for all of us, but become extremely relevant as we address common issues in the continent. So Dalika. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I, I really want to thank the African Development Bank for, for putting together this, this platform starting last year. Um, since last year, when we were here, together with the African Development Bank, we have put together a facility uh, called the African Disaster Risk Finance Facility, which helps our African governments to be able to pay for their premium. It's not a freebie. It's a, it's a matched funding, so they've got to show their commitment. So that kind of thinking for me is critical thinking about new projects, new ways we can intervene, innovation, technology. We are a parametric insurance company. Um, so, so there has to be a new way of thinking, and if we can harness that together with partners, those of you who have money out there, I'm looking at my sister here, please put it in Adrifi with the Africa Development Bank <laughs> so that we can filter it through to the countries, including municipals. But we have also had help from the donors. They helped to set up this institution. So I think that the humanitarian um, machinery, they are the ones through whom we distribute when there is a payout to the countries. So it is actually a very strong partnership platform. No single institution can do it on its own, and no single institution needs to have um, uh, the, the ownership of this space. It is huge, and there is room for everybody. Great. Mrs. Mbele, in 30 so, seconds. So just in addition to what I had said earlier on in terms of the capacity building of the other NDBs, but what is important also, this forum is also about the deals. You know, there's no climate deals that you are seeing. Some of them, the carbon capture, 
skills are still at very pilot phases. So if we can have more of that, that would be great because we can, you know, in future be able to answer with confidence what's our appetite in, in different projects, whether they are for mitigation or adaptation. So the more deals we have, I think the better the conversation. Well, I think that uh, the recommendation would be to really consider this event as a benchmark to replicate uh, in uh, business forum events where a lot of business uh, actors are gathered. Uh, so whenever there is an opportunity to bring this uh, conversation uh, forward, uh, also including uh, in Europe, for instance, I mean, uh, we have uh, a platform for sustainable finance that has been launched by our colleagues from the GFISMA. We, uh, we have a number of uh, countries which are associated to it. I think in Africa it's only um, Kenya, Morocco and South Africa, if I'm not mistaken, and we are happy to connect the dots also with this conversation. Thank you. Excellent. Roberto, last but not least. Yes, tools uh, for this uh, greening the financial system, tools based on science. That's what FIO, that's why I would like to thank the African Development Bank and we want to engage with the vice presidents in order to see how FIO can provide the science of which we are custodian at the service of the platform and the, the alliance. And the last word would be on investment, you say. Investments must be driven by SDG compliance. If we push into that direction, the indicators of the SDGs will go in the right direction. Oh, it's a great, great suggestion that I take away. Number one, uh, as Delica said, this uh, can only happen through partnership. And the fact that we have a room filled with different partners is a testimony that AFAC is really in the right direction in bringing the different players together. And obviously that partnership should be driven by innovation, as Delica said. Number two, we need to really foster some pilot projects to make sure what works, what doesn't work. And then three, we need to really use this as a flagship event whenever we have investment forums so we can actually educate investors about what it takes in climate change. Last question about tool based on science exists. We need to actually make sure we disseminate them. And last but not least, it is important that we understand when it comes to investment, that climate change is something that is extremely important. So with the African Development Bank, hopefully we can achieve that. So on that note, a big round of applause to our speakers. And a big thank to all of you. Now, before we go, we have the Vice President in the room listening very carefully to the conversation. You have one second to come back and tell us what you heard. Uh, are you confident with the African Devon Bank? We are in the right direction. Ole, come over here. You get the right word. Final word. Right. I'd like to thank everybody for a very stimulating conversation. I think that um, we've already started. Um, we have some great thinkers on the panel and also at our various partner institutions. We shouldn't underestimate the power of innovation, and we're seeing it already in terms of financing climate, climate change, like um, Tony said, we should see it as an opportunity. And um, there, there is a lot of money to be made. People in this room understand the language of money. So we, the, the DFIs are there just to help make it happen. You know, we'll provide um, uh, you know, first loss and all other kinds of mitigants to allow us to mainstream climate finance. So thank you so much for your. Now, given that at the African Development Bank, this is really a cross-cutting issue, we are delighted to actually have in the room the Vice President of Agriculture of the African Development Bank, who's right there. And Jennifer, if you can stand, just be recognized. This is the Vice President of Agriculture at the African Development Bank. <laughs> I'm a bit biased because we went to the same school in the US. So. Jennifer, but obviously we've been talking about drought and all these things that affect agriculture on the continent, so it's really important to have somebody who will focus on other sectors as well. On that note, you are free to go. That was a great, great session, but thank you very much. Well done.